supply that you can buy into. Because self-love is nothing more than selfishness and pride wrapped up in a, in a, in a box to make it look good. Kind of like gift wrapped. It's, a, it's, a, it's become a cliche saying. We just kind of just take it and, 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 deal, and, 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 and we think, well, maybe it's true because I've heard it so many times. Self-love church is the ultimate culmination of the worldly mindset. Remember from the beginning of chapter 12, Paul says that it is God's goal to transform our minds in Christ Jesus, to surrender ourselves to him so that his truth might then take over in our lives. And so I want to just make something clear right up front. Self-love is never mentioned one single time anywhere in the scriptures. Self-love love leads to several things. It leads to self-care, right? If you love ourselves, it leads to self-care, which leads to self-devotion, which leads to self-preservation. And all of this focus on yourself, I guarantee you, will ultimately lead to self-pity, self-pride, and really, and eventually, because you're thinking about yourself so much, it's going to lead to depression in your life. It will every single time. If you want to live a truly miserable life, I'll tell you right now this morning, love yourself more than you love other people. You can be as miserable as you want to be, and there's the ticket right there. There's the key. Love yourself and think of yourself. Take care of yourself more than you take care of other people. You will always, always fall into great misery, and I would say very fast, because self-love will always lead you to do something that is very, very, very <laughs> dangerous, and that is to feed yourself, feed your flesh. Feed what makes you feel happy, what makes you feel good first, which will always lead us into sin. Now, the Apostle Paul knew the importance of the ingredient of true love in the life of a true believer. Actually, he wrote on the topic of love in some degree in every one of his epistles, to some degree. It's a pretty amazing thing. It's, it's a pretty important thing if the scriptures in the New Testament, specifically in Paul's apostles, are talking about love in some degree. You, the book of 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, Revelation, the book of John itself. John, the apostle, wrote about love in every one of his writings. And actually, we're going to take a huge section of the book of 1 John this morning to show just how important love is, properly and biblically defined in the life of a Christian. So here in Romans 12, on the heels of teaching the gifts of the Spirit, Paul makes a powerful connection between these gifts and a properly applied, defined and applied definition of love in our own lives. And so let's look at that together. And I know you're going to see the connection right away as soon as I pop this up on the screen. So remember, this is right on the heels of Paul listing the spiritual gifts. Right on the heels of it. And he says this, let love be without hypocrisy. Now that, whew, man, that's awesome. I almost want to jump back into the seven woes and do a full teaching on the, the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. As soon as I read that, it's the first thing I thought of. And we may do that. I don't know. How, much, how, long, how long do you guys want to spend here? Because <laughs> we could spend a lot of time just right there. I can probably preach four or five weeks just on hypocrisy and love. I mean, it might be necessary. I'm going to keep praying for it because I, this wasn't my intent this week to go this direction. It says this, let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. Paul sums up the two greatest commandments in these verses. And actually, I think this is so wonderful because Paul does this exact same thing where he lists the spiritual gifts and then talks about love in the book of 1 Corinthians. Remember, we just spent a whole bunch of time in the, in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, which talks all about the spiritual gifts. And then does anyone know what happens in 1 Corinthians, Corinthians chapter 13? Paul talks about love probably more in depth than anywhere else in the New Testament. He does the exact same thing here to the Romans. He makes the exact same connection. Your spiritual gifts are wonderful, and it's great to know about them. But if you don't know how to apply them in biblical love, we've lost the game before we've even left the ground. So, in these words that we just read, Paul gives us kind of the secret ingredient to using our gifts in a manner that brings honor to the Lord. That we, when we surrender to the Lord in our gifts, we also need to surrender to him in our definition of what it means to love God and to love other person, other people. Again, do you notice anywhere in here where Paul says anything about self-love? No. Love is always directed outwards. Always directed outwards, biblically. And over the next several weeks, we're going to slow down a bit and take a close, in-depth look at what the Bible teaches 
concerning this most important ingredient in the lives of a Christian. If you want to please God and live as a sacrifice to him, you've got to love him more than you love anything else. And if you want to use your gifts to edify and bring honor to the brothers and sisters in the church, you have to love them more than you love yourself as well. Now, I want to point us in the direction of Matthew 22, 34, and 40 because we can't really talk about love until we start getting a grasp of a biblical definition of this. Many of us know this story, very, very important, what happens here. And if you want to go back, I preached a whole sermon series on Matthew, and we, we, we actually covered this section in depth. And we're not going to get into that this morning, uh, but you could go back and, 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 and actually look at the full teaching of this if you'd like to uh, on the website. But Matthew 22, 34 through 40 introduces a very, very, very important topic concerning love. Let's read it together. But when the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, remember, they're trying to trick Jesus. They're trying to, they're trying to find a loophole. They're trying, to, they're trying to pin him to the wall on something. They're trying, to, they're, trying to, uh, they're trying to catch him in a lie or to catch him doing blasphemy or to catch him doing something. But the Pharisees, uh, when the Pharisees heard that Jesus had been silenced the Sadducees, they gathered themselves together. So they're conspiring here. One of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him, that's testing Jesus. For, verse 36, teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. Now that is a actually incredibly profound statement. What, what, what Jesus is saying is that the entire law, the Ten Commandments, is built upon these two principles. Love God first, which by the way takes care of the first four commandments. Right? Do you know the, the commandments in, a, in order? I know my kids do, only because we spend a lot of time with them. Probably a lot of our kids do. If you don't know the commandments in order, I just say, take the time to learn them in order. Okay? You shall have no other gods before me. Do not bow down to any idols. Right? Do not blaspheme my name. And remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Those are the first four commandments. That's the first part of what Jesus says. Love the Lord your God first, and you're going to do these things. You're going to obey those things. Then the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Okay. The fifth commandment, honor thy father and mother. The sixth commandment, thou shalt not kill. The seventh commandment, do not commit adultery. The eighth commandment, do not bear false witness. The ninth commandment, um, now I'm just losing my mind. What's the ninth commandment? Steal. Do not steal. Tenth commandment, do not covet. Right? Do you understand how the second half of the law deals with how we treat other people? Obviously, if we're stealing from people and coveting and, and committing adultery and killing them, obviously we're not loving them. The whole entire law is built around our love. Your obedience, your entire obedience as a Christian is built upon your definition and your application of love. If you have it wrong, you are going to treat people incredibly unbiblically. If you have it right, you're going to treat God and others with more of a biblical understanding of what we're called to do. Remember, brothers and sisters, self-love is nothing that belongs in the life of a Christian. Self-love actually belongs to Satan. You know who loved himself more than God? Satan. And it led him to rebellion, didn't, against God. We don't want to follow in his footsteps and follow in that lie of the world. So if you've ever thought that self-love is, is an important part of your life, cast that out right now. It's a lie of the enemy. Remember, we've been talking about taking thoughts captive. Cast that lie out right now. It's not a biblical concept. And actually, it is a satanic concept because every lie comes from who, church? Satan. He's the father of all lies. The father of them all. So my goal this morning and in the coming weeks is to spend a lot of time to look in depth on biblical love. And it will take us up right through the end of the year. But it is very important that we do so. Because there's nothing more important and foundational to practical Christian living. As we're looking at this sermon series in, in uh, Romans chapter 12, practical Christian living, there's nothing more practical than loving the way God has called us to. There's nothing more practical in your life. Actually, after the foundation, which is Jesus Christ, it is the single most important thing in your life as a Christian. Now, to help us get there, we're going to use uh, 1 Corinthians uh, quite extensively, just like we did when we looked at the gifts of the Spirit. Um, and you know what? Uh, with this, some of the stuff we're going to read this morning and in the coming weeks is probably stuff you've read a hundred times before, maybe more than a hundred times before. 
But brothers and sisters, what I want us to do is not just read it, but look at it very, very in depth, very in depth, because it is vital to the continued growth in your Christian walk. And actually, I think there's probably no better way to end the Christmas season, this season of Advent, than talking about love. Because this season all, is all about God's incredible love for us, as demonstrated through his son, Jesus Christ, coming to this earth and eventually going to that cross on our behalf. The greatest example of love you could ever, ever find. And remember, that love is self-sacrificing, not self-loving. It's self-sacrificing. And true love, brothers and sisters, is always self-sacrificing. Always. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 3, 10 through 15 this morning. According to the grace of God, which was given to me, this is Paul writing, by the way, like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation, and another is building upon it. But each man must be careful how he builds upon that foundation. Now, he's talking about the foundation that is Christ, okay? It's the gospel. That's the foundation. But we have to be careful how we are building on that foundation. If you're in Christ this morning, you are on the rock. That's the best place you can be standing. But we are called to continue to build this life in obedience to Christ. And we have to know how to build that and what to build that upon, okay? Verse 11, for no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid. Of course, that's Christ, which is Jesus Christ. He says so. You can't build another foundation in the Christianity. In, in the church, there's no other foundation. It's either Christ or you're not a Christian. Now, if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become evident. For the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire. And the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work, which he has built on it, remains, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss. But he himself will be saved, yet as through fire. Now, we already looked at the background of the Corinthian church uh, over the past couple of weeks uh, when we looked at the abuses of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Uh, this is a church that's full of very immature Christians. We're not going to go over the whole thing again, but I just want to remind you, they were wild, they were unruly. Not only in life, their unruliness was actually seen in their carnality in their own lives. I mean, these people were involved in things that we, our jaw would hit the floor, we'd gasp at how wicked these people were in their lives. But it also caused them to be unruly and unbiblical in their worship of God, which is what Paul talks about and addresses beginning in Romans chapter 11. Their lives were a mess. Their worship of God was a mess because of their immaturity in their understanding of the greatest attribute that we can possess as Christians, and that's love. They didn't get it. They thought everything was about them, satisfying their flesh and looking more holy than other people in worship. And if you love yourself more than other people, well, that's where you're going to go too. That's the whole point here. And they were lost people, and they needed correction. By the way, this is a side note, I digress a little bit, but how many of you heard what the Pope said this week? Now, I know the Pope is just, uh, he's, he's, not, he's not a godly man. Uh, I would say he's probably even demon-possessed. But he said, the sins of the flesh are really not that bad. He said it this week. Literally, he did. The sins of the flesh, not really that big of a deal. So continue doing whatever sins of the flesh you want. As long as you say, basically, you believe in Jesus and come to confession, you'll be all right. That's what he said this week. Well, we know from our own personal lives and from the teaching of the scriptures, that is a lie directly from the pit of hell. There would be nothing more. Satan would like for nothing more than you to believe that lie. To love yourself so much that you just satisfy all the desires of your flesh anytime you feel like it. Well, brothers and sisters, the Corinthian church, church kind of took what the Pope said this week. They took it to heart. They just did it 2,000 years before he said it. So Paul introduces this letter to them, and really what he's doing is he's addressing their immaturity in the faith, their complete immaturity in the faith. And I hope we can see the connection as we continue that the root cause of their immaturity, the root cause of their, their, their satisfying their sin, their sinful flesh in their life, the root cause in their unruly worship was they didn't know how to love properly. Paul actually has to spend almost two chapters correcting their version of love that they're practicing. That's what 1 Corinthians 13 and part of 14 deals with. He's correcting their idea of what love is. Now, I noticed something amazing when you read the book of 1 Corinthians. We would read 1 Corinthians, and without any other context, we would say, oh, these people just aren't saved. They're not saved. There's no way. Paul never says that. 
He never says that. We're talking about people who have been called into salvation, but they are incredibly immature in their faith. God has to do a lot of sanctifying in their lives. And so if your love is really whack or messed up this morning, I'm not saying you're not saved, and I don't think the scriptures are either. But the scriptures do say something very important. We lack maturity in our faith. We are like children, Paul goes on to say. Like children. And we can't afford to be like children. If we want to live as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, we can't afford to do that. So in this church, now I'm not going to go into full detail here, but one of the things that Paul is addressing is they were, the, the Corinthians were arguing who they followed, right? Some said, well, I, I follow Paul. Another said, well, I follow Apollo, Apollo. The other one says, well, I follow Peter. And Paul's like, what are you talking about? Basically, that's what, he's, what are you talking about? We follow Jesus Christ. That's the foundation that's been laid. It's not me. I'm not the foundation of this church. Apollos isn't either, and neither is Peter. Christ is the foundation. You have it completely wrong from the get-go, is what he's trying to get them to understand. There was actually arguments that arose in this church about who they followed. And what Paul says is, you know what? We're all given different jobs in the kingdom of God. Even though I founded this church, Apollos has been given the pastorship of that church. And hey, listen, I'm okay with that. And Peter has been given a greater apostleship over the entire church. And I'm okay with that too. But that's not our foundation. I am not the foundation of this church. Any of your elders aren't. Not one of you specifically isn't the foundation of this church. If it was, we would be in ruin. We would be like the Corinthian church. Christ is our foundation, and Paul's trying to get them to understand that. So Paul makes that very clear. There's no other foundation worth building on in the first place than Christ alone. So if you're coming to this church because you think I'm so wonderful and you love my personality or my preaching and you think I'm just great, you got the wrong foundation, right? Stop thinking that way. Christ is the foundation of this church. And then from there, we build upon it with the right building blocks. And the right building block, Paul says, and we'll get to it in a moment, the first the first thing we build upon that foundation of Christ is our love. It's the very first thing. Very first and most important ingredient after Christ. And yet, if we're not careful, we will build upon the foundation of Christ with perishable ideas, with things that will, won't hold up and stand the test of time and won't hold up against a life that is truly lived for Jesus Christ. And none of us want to build upon the foundation of Christ with materials that don't last. Not one of us this morning, I don't think, wants to go off in their own version of ministry when God's not calling them to that. And there's no biblical edification to the body in that. And what Paul really says is he makes an important point here, and it's not his greatest point. It's not the overall theme of his point, but he does make a really important point here. Brothers and sisters, if your love for God is not biblical in its application and its definition, if you don't know what really loving God means and putting him first in your life means, if you haven't grasped that yet and you're still living this childish version of love where you love yourself first and kind of give the leftovers to God and other people, what he's saying is when hardship comes in your life, when hardship and trial come, it will reveal the true quality of your faith. The true quality of your faith. When hardship comes, it will shake your life down to its core, down to its foundation. And if that foundation is not built upon Christ first and then the love that we're supposed to not, not just receive from Christ, but to live out biblically, when trial comes, you're going to be a mess. And you know what? When trial comes, suffering comes in some of our lives, some of you are a mess. And I would say it's not because you don't trust in Christ as your Savior, it's you don't build in Christ the proper way. You don't have a true biblical foundation that you're building upon. And so there's a question that I, that I wanted to ask this week. It's actually three questions I wanted to ask each of us this week and just kind of get us thinking in this direction. Am I building on the foundation with the right materials? Now, Christ is the foundation, and if you profess Christ this morning, then you're already standing upon the truest foundation we can stand upon. But are you then building your Christian life on top of that with the right materials, with the right things, with the godly things? Or are you allowing the world to dictate how to live this Christian life? Now, some of you would kind of scoff at that and say, no way! Well, you might find out based on your definition of love and how you're practicing it, that you actually are building upon the foundation of Christ with ungodly things. We don't want that, of course. 
Do I know what the right materials even are? Do you even know how to build your life in Christ the right way? And then is there a building material that is more excellent than all the rest? Now, there are a lot of things in our Christian life that are important, right? There are a lot of things. You look at the fruit of the Spirit, there's nine things there. But notice the first thing that's listed in the fruit of the Spirit is love. And actually, if you, which we're going to read in a little bit in 1 Corinthians 13, at the end of all things, the greatest, the greatest thing that we can possess as Christians is love. So we're going to define that beginning this morning. The question then is, am I building, oops, on the right foundation? Or am I building, my, am I building the right materials on that foundation, which is Christ, I should say? Do I know what those right materials are? Now, for some of you familiar with building a house or a building of some sort, Joel and I are in the middle of building a house for my parents, and uh, you have to do it the right way. You have to follow certain steps. Of course, the foundation is super, super important. I just thought this analogy made so much sense. It's so important that Joel and I didn't dare to try to lay it, okay? <laughs> we hired somebody else to lay that foundation. I don't want to mess that foundation up. Well, brothers and sisters in the Christian walk, and I know this might be a poor analogy, but it makes sense. Christ laid that foundation. We don't dare lay the foundation of trying to earn our salvation, okay? Jesus, someone else laid that foundation. And as we're building the house, it just came rushing to me. Man, I'm so glad we hired somebody who knew what they were doing to build that foundation. Now, as we build upon that foundation and we do it in the right order, we are going to have a strong, sturdy, and stable home for my parents. So the foundation has been laid by Christ, or in my parents' situation, by a man named John DeCrager, who is a very good, <laughs> very good uh, basement pourer, by the way. He's amazing. Can't believe how perfect his foundation was. So Jesus Christ is the most important part, but what do we put on that foundation next? What's the next thing? Is there a really, truly a next thing that must come first? Well, I believe there is, biblically. There has to be something that is applied to our life next before we can build anything else. So when you're building a foundation and you've got this concrete basement and, and you've got this be these beautiful walls all the way around, there's something that comes next that is actually vitally important to the entire building process. And it's something called a sill plate. And actually, I got a little thing here so you can see. So we've got the foundation and then on top of that, you can see we've got this thing called a sill plate. Now that is actually bolted to the foundation. It's, it's, it's a two by six piece of wood. It's bolted to the foundation. And listen, church, everything that is attached to the house is attached to that. Of course, it, that's attached to the foundation, which in our analogy is Christ. But this thing, which I'm calling this sill plate, I know this is a bad foundation, but it works, okay? This sill plate is love. In everything else that we, Joel and I, in a building situation, build upon this foundation is going to be attached to that. And if we don't have that secured, brothers and sisters, the house will eventually fall to ruin. That's the whole point. That's the whole point. So the sill plate comes next, and everything in that house is built upon it. Well, brothers and sisters, the sill pl plate of the Christian life is love. And everything you do, whether it's, uh, whether it's serving the body or serving God or, or doing anything in ministry or raising a family or doing anything else in your life will be attached to the quality of your love and how well you love and how you define love in the first place. Brothers and sisters, the most important thing in the Christian life is not any of these things. Now, these are great things. Please understand me. Obedience and service and wisdom and knowledge and courage and all these, these are great things. And I think these are attributes that we ought to possess with an increasing quality. But it's not the most important thing. And actually, if you try to build these things without that foundation of love in your life, all these things aren't going to mean squat anyways. Actually, Paul says the same thing. We can do whatever. We, we can do wonderful, great, incredible things. But if we don't have love... It's noise. It's a clanging symbol. It is worthless. It is not profitable. So if you're in, uh, doing anything in ministry, you're sharing the gospel with somebody, you're, you're trying to uh, help a brother or sister through a crisis, or you're, or you're giving money, or you're doing anything, and if you're not doing that out of love, it's, it's, it's worthless. It's noise. It, doesn't, it, it, has, it has no real value in your life. If, you, if somebody is in need of money and you're giving it kind of begrudgingly, like, oh my gosh, here they are again. I'm going to have to help them out again. If you're doing that, that's, there's no reward in that. If you're saying, getting a phone call and someone needs help, i got to help these guys again, there's no reward in that. You're not doing it out of love. That's the whole point. And so love, brothers and sisters, is this most excellent ingredient. 
And I want to spend the next several weeks, probably four, maybe five. I don't know. We'll see. I already have written a, this. This sermon series, by the way, is an adaptation of a sermon series that I preached four years ago. But it was so important that I wanted to make most of these points again. So how many of you knew the answer, by the way, to the most important thing to build upon our foundation of Christ, the very first thing? How many of you knew that the answer was love? I, you don't have to raise your hand, but probably, I'm not probably telling you anything super groundbreaking this morning. But how many of us not only know the answer, but actually live our lives like we believe it's the most important thing? Or how many of us truly actually could even define biblical love in the first place? You see, this is why this is the hardest part of, of the preacher or the teacher or any, being in ministry. It is one thing to lead you to the truth of the scriptures. It is a whole other thing for you to begin to apply them to your life. And you see it all the time. You see it all the time. It's the old cliche. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. So brothers and sisters, I hope to lead you to the truth of love and the importance of it, but I can't make you live it. That's where your personal walk and surrender with Christ comes in. That's why the, the book of, uh, uh, of Romans chapter 12, Paul says right up front, to present yourselves as living sacrifices. I can't do that for you. And some of you maybe perhaps want me to be able to do that for you. I can't. You have to do it. I can only bring you so far. You have to then surrender your life to Christ. And so, with that, brothers and sisters, we need to take a look at probably one of the most familiar texts in all the scriptures. But brothers and sisters, I want to say this. This section of scripture needs to be more than just familiar to us. It needs to be more than just familiar. We need to understand it. We need to know it. We need to apply it. We need to surrender our lives in our ideas on love to God's teaching on love. It's not going to do you anything, any good to know it if we're not surrendering to it. Or brothers and sisters, I'll say this, all the work that you do as an individual and that we do as a church, if we do not love the, this, the, this way, then what we're doing here is not going to last. It's not going to last. It's going to be burn up. And I don't want that for any one of us. So let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We're going to actually read uh, through verse 13 this morning. And I'll have it on the screen here. You can turn here if you'd like to as well. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, beginning at verse 1, okay? Now, I know you know it. You can probably, you're going to be able to just probably close your eyes and, excuse me, re recite parts of this along with me. But that's okay. That's okay. I'm not worried about if you know it or not. I'm worried about defining it and living it, okay? Let's look at it with new, fresh eyes this morning. If I speak with tongues of men and angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and all, know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith so as to remove mountains, but I do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, but I do not have love, it profits me nothing. Do you see how love is the most important thing we can build our, our, our relationship upon Christ with the very first thing? Now here we get to the definition, which is going to take us several weeks to define. Love is patient. Love is kind, and it is not jealous. Love does not brag, and it is not arrogant. It does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. Now, self-love tells you to seek your own. It does not seek its own. It is not provoked. Now, that is an interesting word. I can't wait to get to that in the coming weeks. It does not take into account a wrong suffered. It does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. And I can't wait to get into this as well. Brothers and sisters, love is going to continue on through eternity. It is never going anywhere. But if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, that's Christ, the partial will be done away. Here we go. When I was a child, I used to speak like a child, think like a child, reason like a child, but when I became a man, I did away with childish things. Now, he's not just talking about random things. He's talking about our, our definition of love here, very specifically. Very specifically. When it, uh, there are probably uh, no more selfish creatures on the planet than little kids, right? We have to teach them to not be selfish. 
Paul's whole idea here is he's saying, if you're still loving yourself more than God and other people, you're like, just like a kid. You're just like those selfish little creatures that all of us that have kids are trying to raise up to not be selfish little creatures, right? When I became a man, I did with those childish, childish ideas of what love is and how to apply it. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. For now I know in part, but then I will know fully, just as I has also been known fully. But now faith, hope, love abide in these three things, okay? So these are all great things. Faith is great. Hope is great. Love is great. We have to have them all. But listen, the greatest of these is love. Okay, very familiar, right? We know this. We, we probably, I'd say probably a lot of people who aren't even Christians know this. And there's a lot here. That's why it's going to take probably about four weeks to cover all this. But here's the question. And I already know the answer, and so do you. But as individuals, as we think about our love and how we're loving one another, do we love this way? Now, I know none of us can love this way perfectly, okay? But that's, that, that's not where I'm getting at, and it's not Paul either, where Paul's getting at. He knows we're never going to do this perfectly. But some of us, perhaps, haven't even left the ground floor because we still love ourselves more than we love God and other people. And that's where we need to get to. We all need to be leaving the ground floor, brothers and sisters, every one of us. Every one of us need to begin to build love in our lives in a way that is pleasing to God, that will bring edification to other people. Paul says so in Romans chapter 12. He says, be devoted to one another. Devoted. And actually, if you read on verse 11, I can't wait to get there. It's hard work. He, has to say, he says you have to be diligent. You can't give up. Basically what he's saying is don't be lazy because if you're lazy, you're going to go back to loving yourself because it's easier to love yourself, isn't it? So much easier to love yourself. So much easier to love yourself. It's hard to love other people. And so I say this, in your estimation, do, does the church in general love this way? I would say no. Does this church in general love this way? I would say in many ways, yes. But it doesn't mean we have a long, a long way to go. I'd say in the church at large, there's a huge problem, and we'll see how big of a problem that is as we continue. You see, if we lack love, the love that's described in 1 Corinthians 13, the implications are not just for the here and now, but they're also for eternity. And I want to say this, the best way, if any of you have been hurt in your life, the best way for you to heal is to stop thinking about yourself so much and start thinking about God and other people. Live your life for other people. God will heal those wounds. He will every single time. Every single time. And so in our text today, Paul describes our misguided and narrow thoughts concerning love to a people who think and act like children. And so if the version of love that you're currently practicing doesn't line up with what we're going to be talking about over the next several weeks, then my, my hope is that by the end of this, you'll begin to understand. You'll begin to build upon the right foundation in your life. None of us want it to think like a child, act like a child. We all want to be mature in our faith. And the best way we can do that is to begin to put God first, to put others second. And God will take care of the rest. Actually, he says that. Seek me first in my kingdom and my righteousness and I'll take care of all the rest. If you're hurting this morning, God's going to take care of that hurt if you start obeying him. If you keep thinking about yourself and trying to heal yourself, you're never going to heal yourself, ever. It will never happen. You don't have the power to do it. Only God does and he can only do it if you obey him as a living sacrifice. And so, if love, biblically defined and, and, and practically practiced, is not placed in the highest importance in our life, then we're, we're really going to be in trouble. And actually, you're probably going you're, you're gonna, to you're hover in this place of misery and, and, and self-pity and pain for a long time, and I don't want that for any of you. And listen, God doesn't want that for any of you. So, right now, I just want to challenge you. Surrender your ideas of love to God and let him take care of the rest, okay? That's the premise of where we're going. But before we go any further into the actual definition of these words and definition of this love in 1 Corinthians 13, we need to define the word love just period to begin with. That's the most important thing here. We need to have an understanding. Now, if you're reading out of the King James this morning, you'll notice that it doesn't say the word love. It says the word charity. 
Okay, so it's the word charity. So which is it? Is it love or is it charity? Which one's the wrong translation? I'll say this, neither are wrong. They're both great translations. Great translations. I'd say the King James is a little more focused because in the English language, love, man, love can be used to describe just about anything. And you start looking at the definition of charity, it actually narrows it a little bit. But I'll tell you this, not even close, <laughs> not even close to as narrow as it needs to be. There's a biblical definition. Uh, unfortunately, in the English language, we've got one word, love. In the Hebrew, there are several words for love, and they all mean vastly different things. So both translations, charity and love, are actually pretty good, um, but they still leave so much to be desired. And so let's begin to look at this love that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians, that's talked about in the book of 1 John, that's actually talked about every time God talks about loving the Son and the Son loving his children, the Christians, every time. There's a word specifically that's used. In that word, many of us know, you probably pronounced it agape, it's actually agape, but it doesn't matter. We're not, we don't speak Greek anyways. So it's this word agape, or agape, is the right way to pronounce that. And this is going to be a little overwhelming. I just want to show you the breadth and the depth of this word, okay? This is the word agape. If you were to look it up in its definition, there, there, there. So if you'd like to know a little bit more about agape, look in your Greek concordance, and here it is. It's a lot to study right there, okay? One, two, three. There's the definition and its usage in the scriptures. Pretty amazing, isn't it? And you know what? When we say love, we just say love. And yet, agape love is defined so much more than just a word. But I want to give us a start, okay? I want to give us a start so we can at least understand this word. Agape, if you kind of take all three pages and condense it, it's unconditional, unrelenting, unceasing, deep, passionate benevolence and devotion. And of course, that's for God and for others not for ourselves, for God and for others. And this only scratches the surface of its meaning. Scratches the surface. But I want to spend a few moments helping you understand why our text in 1 Corinthians is so vital for you to live by and to understand. We can't simply be familiar with chapter 13, like I said, in agape love by, as, a, as an academic definition. We need to understand it and apply it. And so the, the word literally uh, encompasses not man's definition of love. You'll notice it if you read through the Greek. It has nothing to do with man's definition of love. It has everything to do with God's definition of love. And so agape is love at first demonstrated or shown to us by God the Father and then communicated to us through Jesus Christ. This is what sets agape love apart from any other type of love you can imagine. Agape love comes from the Father. It's demonstrated by the Father. Okay? It's communicated to us by Christ's love for us. But it derives from God. And notice, God's not sitting up in heaven loving himself, is he? No. He's loving the Son first. And actually, you'll see it very, very clearly. That's always the progression. He loves the Son first. And then the Son takes that same love that derived from the Father, and then he gives it to us. And then when he gives it to us, we're supposed to just take it and love ourselves with it, right? Well, obviously, no. If God gives it to Jesus, Jesus gives it to us, then when we receive it, what do we have to do, church? Give it to others. There's the key to love. And so the significance of what we're about to learn concerning love cannot be undervalued or understated this morning. Every one of us needs to understand this. And so please follow me as we continue. First, agape love is the love that the scripture says God has for the Son, Jesus Christ. God loves Jesus with this love, this unconditional, unwavering demonstration of his love for the Son. It comes directly from the Father. That means it derives directly from the Father. There's no other uh, way that this love is derived. You don't get this love from any other source in the world, in the universe. It comes from God alone. And of course, this love comes from the Father, and the Father is perfect, and of course, everything the scriptures say that comes from the Father is good. And so we know this love is good. It's right. It's perfection. It's love expressed in its most perfect and purest form. 
And so God has loved the son with this love, with this agape. But more than this, scripture says that God loves men God loves men with this love too. I can barely gather myself to say that. He loves his son, Jesus Christ, who obeyed him in perfection. But for some reason, he loves men with this love too, who rebel at nearly every chance we can get. Hard to imagine. So not only does God love Jesus, his only son with this love, but he loves us, the scriptures say, with the same love. It's demonstrated to us. We all know that verse, God demonstrates his agape <laughs> to us through Christ. Jesus and God are one, and so Jesus, by his very nature, does the things that please the Father, and so he loves us with his perfect love as well, and that's what, that's what actually drove him to the cross. He loved the Father, and he obeyed the Father first, and that's why he went to the cross and didn't turn away. There's, a, there's an old song in the church, and some of you know it. Uh, it's uh, crucified, laid behind the stone. He lived to die, rejected and alone. Like a rose, trampled on the ground. He took he, the, uh, the fall, and he thought of me above all. No, we don't sing that song, because that's a lie. God did not think of me above all. Jesus did not think of me above all. Doesn't mean he didn't think of me. He thought of obedience and love to the Father above all. And out of that, his love for us is seen and shown. It's demonstrated through that. But Jesus always obeyed the Father first and loved him first. And that's what the scriptures say. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Put him first. That's the first and greatest way we can love, church. So up to this point, we see that God loves the Son with this agape, perfect love, unconditional love. God loves men with this love. And Jesus loves men with this love too. And actually, you can go right on down the line and, and by implication say, the Spirit of God that was within us has the same love because I am the Lord your God. I am one. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But listen, church, this is where the rubber meets the road, okay? This is where the rubber meets the road. It's good and wonderful to understand that this love is perfect. It derives from God. It's given to the Son. The Son gives it to us. We need to know that. But the Bible describes the kind of love that Christians much must have for each other, each other, as this exact same agape love. Now that melts my mind a little bit to think about. I have been called to love others with this same love that God loves me with. Unconditional, unrelenting, deep, benevolent, compassionate, charity for one another. It's best described as a love going forth from the soul, from the very depths of our soul, and then making its home, or God's soul rather, making its home in our soul through the Holy Spirit, and then taking that love that God has shown to you, that has given to you, that he's enlightened you to, and not loving yourself with it, but loving others with it, demonstrating that love to other people. Now that's a powerful love, and like the gifts of the Spirit, church, this love's not for you. It's for others. It's to be demonstrated. It's to be demonstrated to other people. The same God, the same love that God loves Jesus with, I'm supposed to love you with, and you're supposed to love me with, and vice versa, in every way you can think of. And if we do not place this gift of love as the highest calling in our Christian walk, then eventually we'll fail as a people, we'll fail as a church, we'll fail just in general, in probably every aspect of our lives. All of us at one time or another have probably seen people fail dramatically in the way they love other people. Because agape love is not the first importance in their lives, and so they end up doing things that shatter families, shatter churches, shatter friendships. Brothers and sisters, we can't afford to live this way. We can't afford to love this way. We can't. And brothers and sisters, I want to point out another love that the scriptures talk about. It's not a bad love. It's not. But if it's not accompanied with agape love, 
then it is a wholly inadequate love. I want to look at another word that the Bible uses to describe love. And in the right definition, it's, it's fine. It's actually in Romans 12, verses 9 and 10 from our text this morning, Paul uses both agape love and Philadelphia love. Agape love is the head. It's what our, all of our love is built around. And through that, there's another affection that we see called Philadelphia love or philia love would be the, the root to that word. And it literally just means brotherly affection. That's why Paul says in Romans chapter 12, verse 10, we are to be devoted to one another in brotherly love, but also in agape as well. They go hand in hand. We can't be devoted in brotherly love if agape isn't already at the head, if we don't already love unconditionally. Because what happens is, if we don't have agape as our head or how we love, then we're going to base our love on this philia love, which is a brotherly affection, okay? Philia is a love by its definition in its practical usage that doesn't, that, that's derivative is not directly from the Lord. It's a love that actually all men can possess to some degree. Philia love. Actually, the city of Philadelphia is named after this. That's why it's called the city of brotherly love. But you see, philia love, this devotion to one another without agape love as our, as our unchanging, unquenchable love as the head, philia love is far, far, far inadequate. Because what happens with philia love, it's not a description or a definition that's based upon an unconditional dying devotion. It's more of a conditional love. A conditional love. That's why the world loves with this way. I'm going to love you as long as you keep doing and saying the things that make me happy or please me or as long as, I, as, long as our relationship is kind of doing pretty good, I'll love you. The moment it doesn't, well, I'm going to revoke my love for you. And that's how the world operates, is it not? That's how the world operates. Only the church, only a true Christian can even possess agape love. Everybody, to some degree, can possess brotherly affection. Uh, this is just an interesting fact. I, this doesn't really mean anything other than it's interesting. The Greek, you know, we know, we know the word phobia, right? Phobia means a fear. That's actually the, the antonym, the opposite of philia in the Greek. So just a neat little thing there. So philia is the brotherly love, and phobia is really a fear or even a hatred, a despising of something. Just interesting. But brothers and sisters, in America, love is cheap and even further than just filial love, okay? So e even if we just loved each other with a filial love, that wouldn't be good enough, which sounds pretty good, but it's not. Not without agape as our head. We don't even love this way very well in this world. Maybe, unfortunately, in the church. You know, the word love is used when really the word that should be inserted is lust, right? We use the word love and lust interchangeably. People describe how they feel about ice cream, sports, video games, and their pets with that same word, English word, love. Do you see how inadequate that word love is in the English language if we don't have it properly defined? You know, I can guarantee, I probably said I love Baby Ruth candy bars this week. Do I really love them? Agape love them? No, I just like them a lot, right? But that's why that word is so cheapened in this culture. We don't understand it because it's so cheap. It's, it's, it's thrown around so cheaply. And I understand this usage and why we use it that way. But brothers and sisters, it's not how we need to define any, our, our love or, 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 or place our definition of love upon. We can't place our definition of love upon how we use that word in this English culture. Because brothers and sisters, we are never called to love each other in a superficial way. And we've cheapened love to the point where we really don't know what it means and we misapply it in about every aspect of our lives. And I'd say probably to some degree, and I'm not, I'm not reclusing myself from this, I'm to my, myself too, I use this word in a ways that are probably wholly inadequate. Wholly inadequate. Actually, God says that if we love each other with a conditional love, then we do not even know him. Let that sink in. We are not even saved. That's how important it is to understand love and to apply it biblically in our life. Agape, a love given by God, demonstrated by Jesus, and then given to us so that we might repeat it within the body of Christ. And we're going to get to in a few weeks, even not in the body of Christ. What's the best way, the scriptures say, that we can love other people? Through the gospel. If you're not sharing the gospel with anybody, don't try to convince me for one minute that you love them. 
That's what the scriptures teach. Don't try to convince me. Don't try to convince God. If you don't share the gospel, you don't love people. It's plain and simple. We'll get to that in coming weeks. Brothers and sisters, unconditional, unwavering, unending love, free from malice, free from pride, free from selfishness, free from envy, free from self-focus. Agape love does not fail. It does not fail. It does not give up hope on those that hurt you. And brothers and sisters, as we look at it in the coming weeks, it is a love that will continue on for all eternity. All eternity. That's the love that you've been given, you've been shown by God, and it's the love through the Holy Spirit that we are called to repeat. To repeat. Not to just the people it's easy to repeat it to, right? Actually, what good is it, what, what good is it if you could just love people that love you, right? Everybody does that. Even the wick, most wicked sinners do that. Can we love people that are hard to love? Can we love people that are hard to love and don't love us in the same way? But the mind of the person who's conformed to the world loves himself first. But the mind of the person conformed to God loves God and others first. That's the premise this morning that we need to build upon in the next coming weeks. It's very simple, actually, in its understanding. But as a church, if we keep operating in a conditional love then we're headed for disaster. Actually, the, the statistic is the average person spends about three years at a church before they leave, okay? And 98% of the time, statistically, 98% of the time they leave because somebody offended them. Only 2% of the time does somebody leave a church because of actual uh, doctrinal heresies that are being preached and then they leave because they need to find a church that's going to teach them. 98% of the time people leave a church because somebody offended them. And they refuse to love those people. And so they find someone else that they can feel you love for a little while until they offend them. And then they can go to the next place that so they can operate in that same type of love over and over and over and over again. That's why I say, if you want to stay in a, a swirling holding pattern in your Christian walk, refuse to bow to God in his definition of love. You'll be in a holding pattern the rest of your life. You'll never mature in your faith. And you know what, brothers and sisters? Jesus says himself, the world will know us by how we love one another, right? That word is agape. They'll know us because our love will be unconditional. But you know what the world sees when they look at the church most of the time? A conditional love. They think we're a joke. And you know what? They should. They should. They, we say we love, but we don't act any different than the world does. Loving one minute and hating the next. And so with a proper understanding of love in mind, let's finish with looking at the book, book of 1 John. Now, I'm going to use the word agape instead of love every single time it's listed, okay? Every time it's listed in the book of 1 John, we're going to read uh, chapter 3, uh, parts of chapter 3 and parts of chapter 4. And you can follow along on the screen. But instead of saying love, I just, I'm, going to, I'm going to say the word agape because that's the actual Greek word that's used here. And every time I say agape, think of unconditional, unwavering, unrelenting, pure love that derives from the Father, Okay? 1 John 3, 14 through 19, we know that we have passed out of death into life because we agape, the brethren. You want to know if you're saved? Do you love the brethren the way God defines it? That is the first test as a Christian. He who does not agape abides in death, lives in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. We know agape by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the agape of God abide in him? Little children, let us notice... He says little children here too, by the way. He, it's, it's, it, 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 there's a lot of, uh, of uh, teaching about what John could actually really mean here. I think he's actually talking about just the immaturity of our faith. He's talking about, hey, little children, you're still, you're still young in your faith. Listen up because you need to learn. Some theologians think John called all Christians little children because he was so old when he wrote this. So that could be too. Little children, let us not agape with word or with tongue but indeed and in truth. We will know by this that we are of the truth. If you love with agape, you can know that you're in the truth. If you can love unconditionally, you can know you're in the truth because that love only comes from God. 
Somebody in the world can't practice that love. It's impossible because they're not empowered to by the Holy Spirit. Let's move on. 1 John 3, 23 and 24. This is his commandment that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and agape one another. Just as he commanded us, the one who keeps his commandments abides in him and he in him. We know by this that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. 1 John 4, 7 through 13. Beloved, let us agape one another, for agape is from God, and everyone who agapes is born of God and knows God. The one who does not agape does not know God, for God is agape. By this, the agape of God who manifested in us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him in this agape, not that we agaped God, but that he agaped us and sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so agaped us, we ought to agape one another. No one has ever seen God at any time. If we agape one another, God abides in us and his, love, his agape is perfected in us. You want to see God on earth moving his attributes? Start, God, start loving like he loves. That's what John's saying there. But this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And then 4, 16 through 21. God is agape and the one who abides in agape abides in God and God abides in him. By this, agape is perfected with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment because as he is, so also are we in the world, in this world. There is no fear in agape, but perfect agape casts out fear because fear involves punishment and the one who fears is not perfected in agape. We agape because he first agaped us. If someone says, I agape God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For the one who does not agape his brother whom he has seen cannot agape God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, that the one who agapes God should agape his brother also. Whew. Now, that is a, that's, a, that's mind-boggling. When you think about the definition that we just looked at and what John says, you want to know you're truly in the faith? Test your love. Test your love. Is it a self-centered, self-focused, self-love? You're not in the faith. Now, I didn't write these words. God did through the Holy Spirit. And he didn't do that to make us feel bad. He did that, did that so we could test. Test what we're building upon. Test what it is we are living in. What kind of love we are giving and showing. Now that's a lot of agapes and that's just one tiny little section of the scriptures of the New Testament, right? That's a lot of agapes there. Church, if our foundation is not in Christ, if our first building material upon that foundation is not agape, then our work will be burned up. Everything we do or say we do for Christ will come to ruin. Over the next several weeks, we're going to look at how we can grow in our agape. We're going to look at what it is, what it isn't. And the reason that you and I need to learn is because fiery trials will always expose your deficiency and my deficiency in love, in agape love. It will always expose it. And I just, th I can't help but think of a little, of a little child, right? What happens some, when ch children are really young, when they haven't been disciplined well, what happens when they don't get what they want? They throw a tantrum. Everything becomes about them and what they want. And you know what? There's a lot of adults that do that too. If things don't go the way they want, they throw a tantrum. And they start placing the focus off of loving God and other people and trying to love themselves. Now, I'm sure that some of you have seen your love fail during your life at one point or another. Guilty, guilty, guilty. But God wants to grow us in our love, church, and he's not going to give up on teaching us. Are we going to give in to allowing him to teach us? That's really the question over the next coming weeks. When we were children in the faith, we thought like children. We acted like children. We even reasoned like children. But the fastest way to become a mature man or woman in Christ is to understand love and then apply it biblically. That's the fastest way. 
I often get, pe you know, people, I'll spend time with people in counseling, and I just, I just tell them every time, there's not a magic pill to this, right? It takes time. But if you want the quickest way, start focusing on your love. The quickest way to Christian maturity is focus on how you're loving God and loving people. How you're obeying God first, and then out of that obedience, loving people properly. If you want to be healed of past hurts, if you want to grow in your faith, if you want to mature in any way, do that and God will take care of the rest. He, rest, he promises. It's his promise. He'll do it. Brothers and sisters, we all need a mature love, an enduring love, and a love that will see us through right to the very end. Because, you know, I was thinking about this last night. I, I, for some reason, I've been wake, waking up again in the middle of the night. I woke up at three in the morning again, just started praying. And I'm going to be honest with you. The Christian walk is a long walk. It's a long walk. It's not easy. There's times we're going to want to give up. There's times where it's difficult. There's times where we don't want to throw in the towel, so to speak, but we just get tired. We get tired. Brothers and sisters, this love will be part of the building blocks that will see us through to the end. That will give us the strength and the endurance and the patience in trial that we need to always, always continue to do what is good. Paul says so in Romans 12, chapter, chapter 12, verse 9. Never, we have to abhor, we hate what is evil, but we cling always to what is good. It's our love that will help us to cling to those good things in time of difficulty, in time when we want to give up, when, in time when our faith is challenged, in time when that fiery trial comes in our life and begins to burn away all the other su su superficial things that we were trusting in. I love it when God does that, by the way. He burns all the superficial things we were trusting in, and he says, get back to the basics. Get back to building upon the foundation of Christ with the right things. Now, some of you right now, God's doing that right now. And I know some of you are frustrated because I meet with you and, and you, want it, you want God's work to be done. Listen, you're in the best place ever. If you're walking through a fiery trial right now, you're in the best place you can be because God's working on you. He's maturing you and he's teaching you. Be teachable. Be teachable, amen? Brothers and sisters, when I was a child, there were things that I thought were way more important than agape. When I was a child in my faith, there were things that I thought were way more important than love. Boy, was I ever a fool. Man, was I ever a fool to ever believe that. I used to say obedience to God was the most important thing that you could do. All the while missing that you can't obey God unless you have agape first for God, unless you love him with full devotion first. It's the first building block. So brothers and sisters, we need to start from the beginning, and I know it's the end of the year, but we're going to be taking this into the first of the year. We need to start from the beginning, the very first of this year. You want a New Year's resolution, church, that has meaning, eternal meaning? Let's focus on our love. And let's take these next several weeks to really take this seriously. And so I want to challenge each of you to begin to pray for God to change your heart. Some of us need some heart change. Some of us need some application change. All of us need to pray for God to grow us in this agape, to teach us so that we might be mature in our faith. We think of all, we think all sorts of weird things when we're kids that <laughs> make no sense. We just do. I wasn't going to share this, but this is just funny, okay? So when I was little, speaking a different language didn't make any sense to me. I thought that everybody thought English words in their head. But when they spoke, they just spoke in a different language. And I thought, that is so dumb. Why don't they just say the word, I don't know, soup? Why do they have to say something that isn't that word? They're thinking soup in their head, and it comes out in this weird... I used to think that. So do you see how foolish we are when we're young? Brothers and sisters, some of us are foolish with love. And listen, I don't, want, I don't say that to condemn you this morning. I say that because we just need to, we need to start at the right place. We need to start at the foundation. And some of you I know, God is exposing that foundation. That's good. That is good. But brothers and sisters, if you are not a follower of Christ this morning, and I know all of us here, and I hope and I pray, and I know that the conf I've heard the, probably most of your confessions, but I'll tell you this, if you're not a follower of Christ at all, you can't love this way. And so first, brothers and sisters, it starts with repentance and faith in Christ. That's where everything starts in the Christian walk. We repent of our sins. We put our trust in Christ alone. Then we can receive this love for the first time in order to repeat this love in the body of Christ. 
And so I don't want to end without warning any of us who may not be in Christ this morning that our sin separates us from God, but through repentance and faith, we can have eternal life through Jesus Christ, who took, he was the propitiation. We read that this morning. It means he took our punishment upon himself, and he went to that cross, and he died, so that we, through that repentance and faith, may have life in him. He paid the price that we couldn't pay. It's such a wonderful thing. And now we receive the blessings of God's heaven and God's love, and yet we did nothing to earn it or deserve it. It's, it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. And so, brothers and sisters, I hope all of us can begin to focus on this in the coming weeks. I'm so glad that God is giving us the opportunity just preaching through his word. We get to Romans 12, 9, and 10, and boom, it's right there. A topic, really, that I think we need to preach on. We need to hover over. We need to spend some time on. And I'm so thankful. I mean, this just isn't amazing. Like, we've been doing Romans for two years. And all of a sudden, right here, right now, God brings us to this agape love. And I think we need it. I think we need it right now. God is so wonderful. He works so far in advance. And you can take that to the bank in your own life, brothers and sisters. We surrender to him. We can, as uh, Philippians chapter 1, verse 6 says, we can be confident that God is going to finish the work he started in us. And so let's have that confidence as we come before the Lord in prayer this week as we surrender our lives to him. Let's put our confidence, our trust in him, brothers and sisters, and let's take our eyes off of the circumstances of this world. Amen? Let's pray.